So welcome everybody. My name is Melina Abdullah. I'm an organizer with Black Lives Matter. I'm also professor, and, and my, my phone keeps going off. I'm also professor and former chair of Pan-African Studies at Cal State LA. Um, and we have a really, really exciting conversation tonight. We're gonna be talking about Black Studies and um, radical Black education and really um, what Black Studies serves as, especially at this critical juncture. Um, we see, we know Black Studies to be one of the places in which white supremacy is um, disrupted, that it's um, Black Studies is meant to be a disruptor of white supremacist education. It's meant to be a teller of truth, a filling in of information for sure, um, but it's also um, meant to be a way in which we engage in intellectual development that feeds the revolution. So Destiny is one of our guests today. She's also a member of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles and a recent alumna of Pan-African Studies at Cal State LA. She knows that, what do we call the department, Destiny? The intellectual, the intellectual arm of the revolution. The intellectual which definitely arm of the revolution, absolutely. And so that's what we were created to be. We are the only discipline that was founded out, well, ethnic studies more broadly, is the only set of disciplines that was founded out of community demand, right? And um, we are really fortunate to have Ken Montero join us, who was the former dean of the College of Ethnic Studies, um, still the only College of Ethnic Studies in the country, um, although Cal State LA's college is coming online from what I hear this year. Um, but uh, San Francisco State is still the only College of Ethnic Studies in the country. And he will attest to the fact that, you know, students shut down that university for four and a half months, um, along with uh, radical faculty and community members. And so it did not come from the institution. It came from the people making a demand. And so to stay true to what Black Studies is, we remain entrenched in the work, in the radical work of community. And so this is the conversation here. 50 plus years later, we are looking at, 52 years later, we are looking at really forging our way, um, really cementing the next step in the struggle for ethnic studies. And joining us shortly will be assembly member and doctor, uh, former chair of Africana Studies, Dr. Shirley Weber, who will be talking about a bill that just made it through the legislature. Um, it was hard fought and we're waiting on the governor's signature. We're demanding the governor's si signature. We're gonna give you some things that you can do right now to make sure that he signs it, especially in this movement moment. Um, and to put everything in context, so she just won recently the MacArthur Genius Award, right? But before she was their genius, she was already our genius, right? So um, what makes her our genius is because the work that she does, again, is on behalf of the people. I've been challenged recently to just come up with one book cover. My one book cover is absolutely City of Inmates. Um, which is the brilliant work of Dr. Kelly Lytle Hernandez, who I get to call not only a colleague and comrade, but a dear sister and friend. And so we wanna open up with Dr. Kelly Lytle Hernandez, who's gonna ground us a bit in the history of Black Studies. Um, Kelly is over at UCLA, um, the director of the Bunch Center, although you're on leave this year, aren't you? So you get you yes, find I am. a sabbatical, is it sabbatical? <laughs> Sabbatical, you're right. All right, all right. Um, <laughs> so I'm coming off sabbatical, it's a great thing, right? Um, and uh, I, I just wanna open it up to you, um, Kelly, to talk with us a bit about the history of Black Studies and also just personally, why you find your home here. Mm. Thank you, Melina. Of course, I don't know what more I can say than what you just laid out, that Black Studies as a discipline comes out of struggle and remains accountable to struggle. And this is where our communities, our students, our elders 
um, insisted that we have institutional power to tell our own stories, right? You're not gonna tell stories about us anymore. We are gonna tell our own stories. We're gonna research our own history. We're gonna imagine our own futures. And so this for me is what Black Studies is, is that um, autonomous work that we're doing to write our own story and to write the, the liberation, the unfinished freedom movement into reality, right? So that's what we're doing in Black Studies. Um, it certainly happened that way at UCLA about 50 years ago when students um, engaged in a mass uprising to demand that we have a space to study ourselves for ourselves and by ourselves. And that's happened across the country, certainly at CSU LA as well. Why do I find Black Studies to be so powerful, to be the, the place that grounds my thinking? And I see Assemblymember Weber has joined us, and we're both from San Diego. And I grew up in San Diego in a relatively small Black community there on the border. And Black Studies was the way in which I understood the racial violence that was happening um, amid the war on drugs, amid the war on immigrants, that I couldn't understand, I couldn't get my footing about the ways in which all of us were being so racialized and targeted um, through police violence, through border patrol violence, through all of that, without thinking about and grounding myself in the history of black folks in this country. That really is the foundation of all institutional practices and cultures um, and all racialization initiatives here in the country. So that's for me why Black Studies is important personally, but also as the way to understand social relationships in this country. So it's valuable for all people to take this perspective. Um, so that's for me how I came to Black Studies, um, some of the reasons why I value it so much and a, a piece of the history. Thank you, Kelly, and welcome Dr. Weber. We're so thankful that you could join us. Um, Dr. Weber, we're gonna get to AB 1460 in a bit, um, but Dr. Lytle Hernandez lifted up the importance, you know, we now call you assembly member Weber, but you're also one of um, the real early advocates for black studies, Africana studies, Pan-African studies. And so we wanted to just start with a bit of that history and are wondering if you can begin to ground us into why Black Studies in particular, and I know you advocate for ethnic studies more broadly, uh, AB 1460 is about an ethnic studies requirement, but your home was in Africana Studies. You're the former chair of Africana Studies at San, San Diego State, former chair of National Conference for Black Studies, National Council for Black Studies. Um, so can you just ground us in why Black Studies is so important, not just as a discipline, but also as what Destiny um, lifted up as the intellectual arm of the revolution? Sure, you know, one of the, um, I think one of the articles I wrote early on for Jim Turner in his book was the intellectual imperative and necessity of Black Studies. And one of the things, um, because my whole, my, much of my focus was on nationalism and Marcus Garvey and Malcolm X and so forth and so on. And one of the things uh, I discovered, you know, as you look at the whole black power movement that the, um, the most significant remnants of the black power movement is basically black studies. You know, it is the institution that has, that was built and remains. And so when you begin to look at all the things that we advocated for, whether it was black uh, economic development or, you know, other kinds of cultural revolutions and stuff, which are all built in education too. But when we begin to look at that, that structure that, you know, what remained, what was the one thing that was the most tangible thing that we talked about during this whole black power era, uh, it was black studies. And, uh, and, and, and I don't think at the time people, uh, we, we knew just how powerful it would be uh, because keep in mind, most of us were, you know, students in the institution uh, and it wasn't until we probably got into the institution uh, as faculty and really began to understand the power of a faculty member. You know, I mean, you, you know, because we didn't have a lot of them, we didn't know that that you could actually be a scholar and a revolutionary at the same time. You know, that 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 you had you had the time to really develop communities. You know, and 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 you had the access. You had access to young minds that you could then begin to shape and develop a different kind of professional uh, that was there. And so we didn't, we didn't really understand all that stuff. We knew that it was, 
that, that some stuff would happen and we were out there fighting for it. But it wasn't until we really, uh, in the early, late 60s when I was at San, in, in early 70s when I went to San Diego State in 72, and really began to see what, in, how institutions run, particularly large universities, the resources they have access to, and the ability they have to have this flexibility of time and energy uh, to go out and really do the kind of work that's so essential to build communities. And so, um, so you know, and then you're touching the lives of young people in their minds. I just did this Black Studies thing um, uh, the other day for the State Board of Education, and it was interesting to me because um, one of the things that was so interesting was to listen to the students begin to tell me all kinds of stuff. My phone, my thing is just going all kind of crazy, but I'm sure you can guys still, can still hear me and see me. I can't see you, but anyway, they, um, you know, these students began to tell me all the stuff that they had experienced and why those things were so important in terms of the faculty and the students and how it changed their life. And I, you know, and, 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 and you know, my, my whole, my mentor was Malefi Asante. And had he not been in Black Studies and been there, I never would have gone to graduate school. I never would have been a Woodrow Wilson fellow. I wouldn't have done those things because there was nobody there opening these doors for us at the institutions. And so what happened when you began to talk about Black studies in its early development in terms of not only the academic things and things we need to do, but it really, really provides a, an opportunity for, uh, to, to build communities that are oftentimes not built in other ways. We could develop standards that we could use to, to, to evaluate faculty where, where central to their work was working in the Black community. Where before, if you, were, if you were in the history department and you did something Black, that didn't even count. You know, that didn't even count toward tenure, promotion, or anything. And it also gave us an opportunity to have black leadership, you know, because once you had a department, you know, you sat on the council with the deans. You know, you sat on these meetings. You went into these places where we were not going because of somebody else was in there. So you then had a spot. I mean, for, for the, you know, I was at State for 40 years, probably 30 of those 40s, I was chair of the department. Only black chair in the whole camp, on the whole campus, okay? The only black chair. So which means when they had a meeting, whether whatever it was, you know, I was in those meetings, you know, and, and you had access to, to knowledge and power that these institutions have. And they basically touched the, the lives of young people and really determined the politics of the world. And so, you know, so black studies now is at the table, you know, and I don't think any of us knew at that time what it would mean to be sitting at the table because of the fact that we had never been there before. And, and they were strategic in trying not to let us at the table. You know, they, they wanted to build departments that didn't have a tenure faculty uh, that were just programs, or they wanted to put you in these other departments so that somebody else would always be evaluating your work so that you could never really be assessed and evaluated by black people. And, uh, and, and, and initially, people didn't understand the power of that. You know, they didn't understand it, so we had these departments with all these kinds of configurations. We were fortunate in San Diego State that we had a person named Harold Brown who wasn't an academician, but was a businessman. And he put together the Black Studies Department and he hired us all on tenure track, you know, and which was, which was, which we didn't under, we would have gone and not been on tenure track and we've been happy to do the movement kind of thing. But Harold made sure we were all on tenure track, you know, and, and, and that really opened the doors of power for us that others had, that had been locked out because there were so many departments around the nation who were programs. And as soon as the, the, the tide changed, people were gone. You know, the, the, the whole move went somewhere else. And so, you know, in, in the beginning, we, I don't think we thoroughly understood the power that we were walking into when we talked about black studies and the power of the university and being in those places that we had not been before. We've been in black, in, in black universities, but not in white universities in terms of what was available to us. And the fact that we could then be a scholars, we could be, you know, we could write these articles and we could also protest and we can also build our community, and we can serve on boards in our community, and we can be a resource to the community, and that would count towards something, you know. So, um, you know, so when, in, in this initial phase, we were just fighting for, for what we thought was, was good and what Du Bois had told us and Carter G. Woodson and all these other scholars had told us that we needed to know about ourselves, and, and we did. We wanted to know this information, and it was empowering to know it. But in addition to that, and we're still fighting the ivory tower drama because these folks don't give it up. You know, I mean, they don't give it up. I was looking at some, some films from uh, uh, San Francisco State and the people on the Board of Trustees almost look like the same people now saying no, 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 
no, no, no. And everybody keeps telling them, oh, well, you should play the game show. You got you to gotta go through the system and all that crap. I said, really, remember? I've been through the system, okay? I know what the system cannot do. And I know y'all lie a lot, okay? And so I, I'm, not, I'm not buying that anymore. I tell them all the time. Remember when y'all put me on a boat and told me I was going on a cruise and I ended up here in slavery? I don't buy those arguments no more, okay? You can't trick me no more. First time you trick me, second time, no. And so we have to, so we get into this point where once again, when you start cracking open that power base, they are putting up their forces, they're using their arguments, they, they want to delay, delay, delay. And so I know they're upset now because we're almost at the end of this process, but, but that's where the power is. That's where the power is in this society. It's really in these ivory towers. And, uh, and, 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 and touching the minds and the lives of young people, because you can transform the whole world uh, by teaching young people what they need to know and get and equipping them with the kind of analytical and critical skills that make a difference. Look at you guys, all these young folks we got. I mean, you make a difference. You are definitely changing the world. And, and that's important. And you can probably identify somebody who helped you change it, who brought you to this un a realization that you can do both of them, that you can be the scholar and this activist and you can change the world and, and you got now the skills and the knowledge to do it. But I don't think we knew that when we started Black Studies. We did not know it at the time. But it, it's, it's been the most significant piece of the Black Power movement uh, in the, out of the 60s, the most lasting, lasting 50 years, where most other kind of programs we can think about kind of faded away. But, it, but this has, has, has got its life and continues to grow and develop. Right. I'm so glad you said that, because I've been saying that it's the most enduring victory of the Black Power movement. And I said, you know, I really should check in before I say that. But for me, it has been that. And um, when we talk about people who make a difference and people showing us the way, I say this about you a lot, but I, I think I've had one or two opportunities to say this to you, that you really are one of my sheroes. And I'm just so grateful for the way that you fearlessly advocate for us, that you unabashedly advocate for us, not just Black Studies, but everything that you feel is right for Black people, you fight for it in every space you occupy. And I just um, see so much, um, you model for us what we should be. And so we're grateful for you, Dr. Weber. But you're my good children, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ken, I wanna go to you because I want you to just kind of ground things a bit in San Francisco State, one of the things, one of the strategic mistakes I think that this system is making is if I ran the CSU, I would be bragging. I would be here going, we are the home of black studies. We're in a Black Lives Matter movement. Now the New York Times has said that Black Lives Matter may be and is probably the largest movement in US history. And if I ran the Cal State system, I'd be going, and we're home to the most enduring victory of the Black Power Movement and are the future of Black freedom struggle. But instead, they're running from it, right? So I'd like you as kind of, I know you were an administrator, but you were a different kind of administrator, <laughs> right? I'd love for you to ground us a bit in what San Francisco State served as a site of. You did a tremendous job as Dean of the College of Ethnic Studies, really enshrining that history. Um, and then after we talk to you, of course, we're gonna talk to Destiny about what Black Studies means to her. Thank you. And if you don't mind, because uh, we're doing this, I'm gonna, um, you're younger than I am, but I'm gonna refer to you as Dr. Abdullah for a lot of reasons not just because you're a fabulous scholar and a former chair and all that, but I'd like us to go back and forth and use our first names, last names, doctor, and, and validate all the names we are willing to answer to. Because I think that one of the things that this uh, journey called Black Studies, and some of us, as we, we, we're mentioning in our personal lives, was also a personal journey, was really reclaiming our sane black minds and our sane black names and our sane, sane, I'm not saying sane, I'm saying sane with an N, sane black communities when we were being brought through a crazy world trying to give us a crazy mind 
to hopefully infect our whole community. And I'm mixing that metaphor for a reason in the moment, but also because I'm a psychologist and you're gonna see that that was an important part for me. Uh, the San Francisco State Strike, 1968, 68 to 69, uh, the longest ever before or ever since student-led strike, shut the university down for about a half a year. Um, to give you a sense of what that did to administrators at other institutions. Fast forward for a moment, because we want to go back again. Fast forward a couple decades. I am now an assistant professor with the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. A faculty member shows me where they got it from, should have gotten a copy of it, but didn't. Bad academics on my part, as well as being nosy. But the letter was from the chancellor in 68 at U of I, UC, saying, whatever you do, don't let us don't let them do a San Francisco state to us. Now, I kind of knew it emotionally because that strike, I was in Massachusetts growing up. I heard about this strike and as a student, I'm just a kid trying to make my way. All I knew was there's something wrong, my friends think something's wrong, and these crazy students in San Francisco State said, well, we'll shut it down. Now, we didn't do as good a job. We shut it down for a day. The police surrounded the, the, the whole thing, and our parents came and picked us up. It wasn't quite the same thing, but the moment, you've got to understand the moment, what you've got is a bunch of young people knowing it's wrong and trying to figure out what's right and not having a single institutional mentor, faculty member, or whatever to help us get through this. So I arrived at college knowing vaguely about this, but a few things you need to know about it. One, blacks, the first black student union was actually formed at San Francisco State. It was changed, the, the transformational moment was it took the Negro Student Association, a cultural organization, and transformed it into a political revolutionary movement. So there were folks already organizing and doing things, but it needed to go from we're learning to we're doing. That BSU became the anchor for what the Third World Liberation Front was. And their model is critical for the studies. All of the ethnic groups that came together with their organizations gave deference to each other's experiences and voices this already was the beginning of an intellectual shift in the academy because the standing academy's job is to homogenize everyone into a false narrative that's only a few hundred years old where somehow white people came from a place like white land there is no white land there is no white lish but they created a place and a time and a space and then they not only taught white people this narrative they taught us this narrative and the narrative was, and whoever this white land, white lish people are, they are better than everybody else. We had to unpackage that, relearn, because the knowledge was out there. We just didn't know it was in schools. And that's what I had to learn as an academic coming through. All I knew as a kid coming up was, we didn't know what college was. My grandparents didn't know. They didn't go to school at all. My, grand, my parents went to high school, but they didn't go to college. All they knew was we were going to go to college. They didn't know where it was, and they just wanted us to go. And I just knew I was good at this academic thing, but I absolutely knew that it had nothing to do with my life. I did not know until I got there that white folks had this whole institution to teach their life, to affirm their life. And the most important part that I think uh, Dr. Weber brought up was, and to put the institutional wealth and power behind what you thought, what you felt, what you did. So what you had was a group of folks, Third World Liberation Front, and they clustered themselves around American Indian, Asian American, Black Studies, and that time called Raza Studies. And they said, we will all have a department when we finish this, institutionalize it. And we will come together as a collective in a school, then now we call it a college. That model, Dr. Weber mentioned it about the importance of a department, getting control over institutional resources and institutional powers and putting that into the university, reshaped not only San Francisco State, but it reverberated around the nation. It also had backlash or white lash then, because back sounds too much like black. Um, that, that institutions 
had written policies to try to keep Africana studies, black studies from being a department, put black people all around the campus and let them meet once a week. That's it. But don't let them be a department. And if you get more than one department and you have to get a department, don't let them get together in a college of ethnic studies. And so I remember being taught at Stanford University that the UC model was better because it was all diffuse. And the San Francisco State model was the dregs intellectually. It's good that I learned early on, as my, my friend and colleague said, to not believe anymore. It's a sad thing. I was a nice, naive kid. I was saddened. I mourned when I realized how many adults were lying to me about how many things, and then to become an adult and have colleagues look me dead in the eyes and lie to me. It hurt me until I stopped doing that and saying, you know, something is just information. I'm a psychologist. I've dealt with crazy of all sorts. Why am I letting myself, I'm not keeping my boundaries. I need to be more professional with these folks and understand that we're not only going to reclaim our mind, but we're going to give them the opportunity to reclaim theirs if they'd like to, but it's not our water to carry. So that is the sort of a personal approach to the political piece of putting together a set of ideas that we're about organizing as a community, then a set of communities, and then adding our intellectual achievements and our accomplishments and our power together. The last thing I want, there's an illusion, the last point I want to make is there's an illusion that because it came from the community, it did not have an academic grounding. Now, I'm going to take the easiest one first. Yes, there were people like Dr. Nathan Hare with two doctorates before he got to San Francisco State and still got fired. And he's still alive, and we should continue to honor him while he's alive, as well as when he, uh, if any of us might, I'm, the way he's going, I may go before him. So I'm not going to say that sort of thing. But basically, there were folks who, um, who were there, who were already in their own right academics as certified, but there were also writers and poets and historians who may or may not have finished their degrees at their universities, but were the best read scholars in the fields that they were teaching. In other words, there weren't any white folks who could have certified them. Most of us have degrees from people who did not certify us in what we currently do. As an African black psychologist, I got that from the Association of Black Psychologists. I did not get that from Dartmouth College. I did not get that from Stanford University. Though there were a couple of individuals along that way that helped and guided me. But collectively, in August, we up and went to the Association of Black Psychologists to get together. So I'm gonna stop on that one. And just, I hope I mixed enough personal, structural, political, and you are right, if you, if administrators had, were in their right minds, whatever their color, they were in their right minds, they would be celebrating that the birth of black studies was in the CSU. Right. But they are not in their right minds. Mm. And um, uh, it's not our water to carry, but as professionals, uh, we might ha have to help them. That's $300 an hour and I'm good for it, except I'm not a clinician, but I can recommend some good people. <laughs> but we actually are not only recollecting, recollecting our mind individually and collectively, and the African mind individually and collectively, but we are recentering, not for egotistical reasons, but we're recentering the reality of the world as African centered so that the rest of the world can get their minds right and see that they have a valid place in the universe. It's just not the one they constructed, yeah. in my opinion. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Montero. We appreciate that. Um, that was a great perspective. And I think it's also something that destiny can pick up on because as we talk about the struggle that birthed ethnic studies, there's also um, this piece of black studies that reminds us to never succumb to the power that is meant to um, not empower us, but oppress us, right? So never succumb to it. And there's a reason that um, I'm also an organizer with Black Lives Matter, that half of the original folks who convened to form Black Lives Matter were Pan-African Studies students from Cal State LA, right? Because in the classroom, we talk about the importance of standing up, the importance of the fight, the 
real reality that your permanent identity is not a student, but you will always be black. And so you always have to fight for black folks. And that's why we're the intellectual arm of the revolution. We're not revolutionary intellectuals, right? We are, our identity is the opposite, that we are intellectual, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, we're intellectual revolutionaries, not revolutionary intellectuals. Does that make sense? Yeah. So Destiny, what's been your experience? And I can't believe that I, uh, when I come back in the fall, that you will no longer be there as a student, um, but you are one of the most um, esteemed alumna of the department who was accepted to doctoral study, but you're taking a break. You're not going on to get your PhD yet, right? Not, it's coming, but not yet. Yes. They haven't seen the last of me. These institutions have not seen the last of me. But first, I want to say I'm so grateful and honored to be a part of this conversation. I feel like um, this is one that I'm, I'm happy that I can be a part of and take part in. And I look back at my undergrad experience and can just hope that I do as much for my community as some of you have done, of, has all of you have done. But my experience coming to Black Studies will first... Um, my major, I started off as a theater major and I added Pan-African Studies as my second major. And I always say that I don't think that my, I didn't consider myself really like a scholar until I came to Pan-African Studies because that's when I really submerged myself into um, the work, the information and all of, like when we talk about the intellectual arm of the revolution, all, all of it. And so that was the first time I was able to contextualize and, um, my experiences as a black woman but also it it narrowed the vision of what i wanted to do and my vision of who i thought i was going to be in the future and i think that it really did make my purpose even more clear and so um i came to pan-african studies completely i think unaware of my positioning to an extent however i think i was able to better understand it for the work that I'm doing even within theater and so I always say like praxis is one of the things that um, Pan-African Studies taught me because it merged what I was learning in school in my classes with what I was doing in my work whether it was on stage or off stage with like organizations on campus or off campus um, and something that Dr. Weber said earlier that really resonated with me was how Pan-African Studies taught me to be a scholar and a revolutionary, because I never considered myself to be a revolutionary, and I never considered myself to be um, the future, because I know how we, we always say, like, the kids or the children and the youth are the future, and I never considered it until I became a part of Black Studies, and I started to learn more, and I started to grow more as a person, as an individual, and also as a scholar. And so, um, when I think of Pan-African Studies, when I think of Black Studies, I think of community, I think of family. Um, I think it's the first place that I came where I knew people actually cared about my well-being as a student. I knew that I could rely on my professors and my um, chair to hold me accountable and also to give me the resources and help me to stay on track to where I need to go. And so um, I would definitely say that Pan-African Studies changed my life not only, but I could also see how it's changed others around me as well. Great. I'm trying to figure out because, you know, I, I'm, I'm not as technolo technologically savvy as sometimes I think I am. I can't figure out how to turn the volume off on this phone. I need you over here, Destiny. Um, <laughs> I got it. I got it. I figured it out. I got a new phone. So I don't know. Um, I just before we get into how we're moving things forward, um, I just want to share a little bit about um, how I came to Pan-African Studies, how I came to Black Studies. I came out of Berkeley High School, which when I was in high school was the only high school in the entire country that had an entire Black Studies department. And um, I came of age in the 90s, which still makes me 29, so don't let the math fool you. Um, but for me, as a girl who grew up in East Oakland, that was also the height of the crack cocaine epidemic. And for me, Black Studies really served as a place of refuge. Um, my teacher, Mr. Navies, who was the chair of the department, 
um, really helped all of us, many of whom were from East Oakland. You know, we lied about our addresses to be able to get into better schools. So that's how we got to Berkeley High in the first place. But we're really um, exposed to the truth of who we were for the first time. And it doesn't mean that, you know, my mother, um, exposed me as much as she could, right? But she was also an elementary school teacher and a single mother and a community other mother and did what she could. But when you talk about a teenage girl, you also need it from somewhere else. And um, Mr. Navies really helped me. And I think anybody who went to, any black student who went to Berkeley High during that era um, we will say Mr. Navy saved our lives, right? Black studies saved our lives, right? In all honesty, and I don't think I've ever shared this with you, Destiny, I was on a completely different track. I had gone to jail. I always talk about going to jail six times. No, I've been to jail six times for protesting. I didn't talk about, you know, the early times, right? When it was not for protesting, right? Um, but I was, you know, that's what was happening in East Oakland during that time. And um, Black Studies really planted seeds for me. I wound up dropping out of regular school anyway in the 11th grade, went to independent studies. Um, thankfully, it was new, so Howard University didn't know what happened and why I all of a sudden had a 4.0. But everybody in independent studies gets a 4.0. You just do your hours, right? And you get an A, um, which really means that you report hours from when you wrote the answers out the back of the book, right? Um, and that got me into Howard. But Mr. Navies had already planted those seeds. And so when I went to Howard, I majored in, in African-American studies because it was all that I liked. It was the only thing that I liked. It was the only place I felt validated. And so it's important that when we talk about Black studies, um, that we understand it's not just an academic endeavor. It's not just about exposing students to readings. I'd never heard of France Fanon until I got to Howard, right? Um, I hadn't heard of um, Mr. Navies would bring us into the classroom and he would put a record, see this is now really telling how old I am. He would put a record on the record player. Right? And he would tell everybody in the classroom to close their eyes and write down what you felt. By the end of, you know, maybe the first term, we knew who Ella Baker was. I mean, Ella Baker, Ella Fitzgerald was. We knew um, who Miles Davis was. We knew what Dizzy Gillespie sounded like. We could feel the pain and the power and the laughter and the joy of each note, right? And so we became scholars of, of people like that. We knew that there were black playwrights like Lorraine Hansberry. We were exposed to things that we weren't exposed to and it validated us. It helped us to step into our fullest selves, even though some people like me would still drop out, right? Um, so it's really important that we understand Black Studies as that. And I think that in understanding Black Studies as that, it obligates us to this um, discipline, but also to this intellectual endeavor. And so what we see moving right now is an opportunity to entrench Black Studies into the university. 52 years later, you know, and we got to be real clear, we have been fighting for our existence for the entire time. If we close our eyes, if we step away for one minute, they will undo us, right? But what you've proposed, Dr. Weber, really makes it very difficult for them to undo us. And your bill, Assembly Bill 1460, which will make ethnic studies a requirement in the Cal State system, entrenches us into this university system that has all of those resources and power that you talked about. So I wonder, and I'm realizing um, we're running a little short on time because we wanna make sure that we get viewer questions in. So if you are watching this, please drop your questions into the chat. Please um, leave a message on Facebook Live. You put that in and we will, Philip is watching those messages um, and he'll, 
feed those to us and we'll make sure that we respond. But quickly, Dr. Weber, I'm hoping that you can just give us a quick overview of AB 1460 and why you proposed it. Sure, um, AB 1460 is, is really a very simple bill. I mean, it, it basically says that every student who graduates from Cal State University must complete at least three units of ethnic studies. And ethnic studies is, is, is defined as Africana studies, uh, Latino studies, uh, Asian American studies, and Native American studies. Now, of course, everybody in the world wants to be ethnic now. I understand that. And, uh, and I'm constantly getting requests, well, why can't the, uh, you know, Armenians be ethnic? And why can't, you know, all these other people? But the bottom line is that the discipline of ethnic studies has been defined for 50 years. And so uh, I'm holding fast to that definition. Uh, it has gotten now out of both houses. It has to go back to our house for concurrence, which is a simple process. Uh, right now, the chancellor is fighting it by putting up an alternative proposal that waters down everything and includes everything and once again does not address the issues. Uh, we've been fighting it and will continue to fight. Hopefully, the governor will sign the bill. Uh, we go back on the 27th. We'll get the bill uh, passed through concurrence and hopefully get the governor to sign it. It'll be the first bill basically for any statewide system considering the size of the Cal State University system. Uh, the first requirement for ethnic studies for every student to take an ethnic studies class. Now that will institutionalize ethnic studies as a subject matter and, um, and means that, uh, that those institutions will have to have those courses available for students to take those courses. We should see, and, 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 and it's no small thing as I told people because the university is now trying to say, well, if we put that in, it will cost a lot of money. And, and so forth and so on. Well, you know, the good thing is I remind them, I've been, I was at the university for 40 years, so I know that's a lot, because the university writes new courses all the time, expands programs all the time, and they tell us that the reason why they're able to do that is that that means because they don't have all tenured faculty, they have some adjunct faculty, and they have that flexibility to change when the weather changes and when they need to change. So I know this is a bunch of crap when they start telling them it's gonna take millions of dollars and all that kind of stuff. No, what it means is that some white folks that you hired won't get hired. That's what it means. I mean, people, and I told myself, so don't, don't try to, and, and, and that, that's what it means. They will not get hired. There'll be fewer, there were fewer of them and, and a few more of us to basically address these issues. And so I understand the economics of it, the politics of it, you know, they, they run these games. I said, but you know, it, it's a zero sum game. That's the bottom line. We have not increased the requirements. They still have 120 credits they have to take in order to graduate. And so when they start talking crazy like that, I remind them that I served on every committee the university ever had at every level. So I know what the university does. I know how they operate. I know how they add new classes. San Diego State just added new classes to deal with COVID and to deal with uh, police uh, uh, giving certification for police officers and so forth and so on. How they add all that and, and get no more money, you know? So, you know, I, that was one of the good things of being at the university. When you're totally entrenched in it and you're really aware of the stuff they do, and then they come up with these crazy stuff like this at the assembly and I say to the people straight up, they lying, it's not true. You know, let me tell you how they operate. I said, and remember, I was there with you for 40 years, okay? So you can't run the okie doke on me because you just did this the other day. And I pulled out all the stuff they just did in terms of changing classes, new requirements, this, this, this. I served on a zillion committees where we changed the G requirements over and over and over again and never asked for a dime, okay? So, uh, so we're fighting this battle. And the good thing is that most of us have been entrenched in this institution for 40, 50 years, and we know the rules. And if we're smart enough, we'll apply it and let them know. So we're at a point now where we're at the finish line. And so everyone should be calling and making sure the governor knows that he has a responsibility that signed 1460. And once he signs it, it becomes California law. Great, and so we are, people are asking what they can do to support the bill. Um, we're asking everybody to tweet at the governor. Um, so you can say, pass AB 1460, pass AB 1460 to make ethnic studies a Cal State requirement. And he is at CA Governor, at CA Governor. Um, there's also a phone number that I'm about to look up right now. Um, and I'll give you that phone number in just a minute. Destiny, you've been a part of advocating for this bill. Can you tell us why? 
Yes. So I've been part of advocating for this bill. I think we went, it was last year, 2019, I went to lobby for this bill with a group of other students from SQE Students for Quality Education at Cal State LA. And also at other, um, I think other schools came as well. Mm -hmm. But I'm part of advocating for this bill because one, ethnic studies, I already spoke about like how black, what black studies means to me, but what it can do for other students. I think that especially now with the moment, the movement that we're in now and with all that's going on, um, ethnic studies helped me even contextualize all of these different things and all of these different terminologies and all of these different experiences I was having um, in the classroom, but also like protesting and rallying and things like that. And so I think that it's important for students to not only know who they are, but also just be able to experience that within the classroom. Because for me, I was never taught about who I was from, well, I was taught about who I was, but I was only taught certain parts or like the watered down parts or the colonized parts, those parts, but not that I'm powerful, that where my people have came from, what we've done, what we will continue to do. And so that's primarily one of the reasons why I fought so hard for ethnic studies to become a requirement at CSUs, because I feel like that's something that all students should have the opportunity to feel and to endure and to learn, especially because you're we're trusting these institutions, we're paying these institutions to um, give us this information and to teach us, but there's absence in all in all aspects if you exclude black people there's absence in psychology whether it's theater whether it's in all of those aspects and so that's primarily the main reason why i think that why i fought for ethnic studies to be a requirement great and we do thank you megan for dropping it in the chat the phone number so call tomorrow morning you could call tonight and just fill up the voicemail 916-445 Four four five two eight four one is the phone number to the governor's office. You want to call and say, yes, we need him to sign AB 1460 to make uh, ethnic studies a Cal State requirement. Again, that's 916-445-2841. Um, and you can also tweet him at CA Governor. Tweet him at CA Governor. Um, one of the things that just came up in the chat, and then I'd like to go over to Dr. Montero to talk about um, his ad advocacy around the bill as well. But one of the things that just came up um, from the Facebook viewers, um, Dr. Hernandez, is um, how does Black Studies benefit people outside the community? And I believe your work um, with Million Dollar Hoods couldn't come from any other place than Black Studies. So could you just quickly describe Million Dollar Hoods and why it's important and why it comes out of Black Studies in particular? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. So Million Dollar Hoods is what we call a university-based but community-driven research project at UCLA and based at the Ralph J. Bunch Center for African American Studies. What we do is we collect up arrest and jail data from across the state of California, and we work with most impacted communities to analyze that data. So what we're doing is we're taking this big data moment and we're working with community to tell our own stories about what policing is doing in our communities. We're taking big data and we're shifting the narrative. Um, this is a kind of analysis that couldn't happen without the praxis of Black Studies, which is about community-informed and community-driven knowledge production. So it's not something that happens isolated in the academy, in our peer-reviewed journals, but it is community-embedded and community-driven. And I think that has been um, the, the power of this project, is that we are harnessing this um, tactic that is so often used against us, which is math and big data and we're driving it in our own direction for our own liberation. So that's what we do at, at Million Dollar Hoods. I like the way you're conceptualizing the university. I also like to call the university the People's Research Center, right? And Black Studies is the home of Black folks' research centers. So the, the radical potential of this ethnic studies bill I wanna come back to and speak a little bit as well. I think Dr. Weber is totally right is the fear that they're going to have to transform the faculty of these campuses to be able to um, accommodate and to push forward with ethnic studies. It's the fear, as Destiny is saying, of giving Black students a true home and sanctuary at the university. Um, 
I think that's definitely part of the resistance. But it's also about shifting the knowledge baseline for everybody, right, who goes through the Cal State system. What does it mean when black folks, brown folks, indigenous folks, API folks, and white folks all know this history, all know this story, are finding new ways to connect with the human evolution to this moment? And I think that's the radical potential of all of this, is that there's deep fear about what happens when we shift the baseline of knowledge for everybody. And I just applaud the work that Dr. Weber and everyone else is doing that 50 years from now, if we're able to get this bill passed, we'll be having an entirely different conversation because the knowledge base will be transformed by this kind of work happening in the academy. Indeed. And one of the things that I think really fed this bill is the really vital work of the Ethnic Studies Council. Um, we had a task force on the advancement of ethnic studies, and we developed a really important report. And Dr. Montero was on that council, led much of the writing, and now is leading the Ethnic Studies Council. Um, we're seeing a really fierce pushback against this bill, and they're using all kinds of rules they're using well it um it gets in the way of of shared governance um it's going to be a, a precedent setting what happens if people come and say they want a different requirement right um all of that is coming but i think you know it's a very thinly veiled attempt to advance white supremacy um, and entrench white supremacy in opposition to black studies and ethnic studies, which really is freedom struggle on the campuses, right? Um, so Dr. Montero, I'm just wondering if you can um, give just a quick, because it's 7.52, so we got a, just a couple of minutes and a few more questions. If you could give us just a quick overview um, of how that came to be of the report of the ethnic of the task force and then what Eth the ethnic studies council is doing to push back against um the chancellor's office really who's trying to block this bill thank you i um and i'm gonna say melina this time because <laughs> it's just feeling warm but um first for the folks who want to know of a, a reference document the if you just put into your search engine cal state ethnic studies task force you will come to the report that's going to be good for you as a background for this act, act the activism it's also going to review to give you a sense of what ethnic studies is it also gives you a sense of um resources to go to so it's it's also that so we played by the rules and we played by them uh well above the bar we put together a blue rib ribbon group and this is where our optimism was the chancellor was new the chancellor said yes, and the chancellor was on board. Four presidents, 10 faculty members, students, uh, administrators came together for a two year writing period. So it was published in 2016, but it started in 2014. So we collected data, we did the literature reviews, we did the interviews and produced a report not just coming off the top of our head, but recommendations of not only to require an ethnic studies course, but what it would look like to actually implement ethnic studies in a more complete way in the university. So it's a blueprint, okay. We anticipated, we didn't want it, but we anticipated that as soon as it was real, we would hit the uh, fears that um, Dr. Light Hernandez, Kelly, if you don't mind, um, uh, that, that she was talking about. One was they were looking at their own jobs, but it's a fantasy. We're not asking for anyone who currently has a job not to have a job. They're worried about their clone. Will the person who looks like me, feels like me, have my job when I leave? That's how crazy it is. And they're worried about having a discipline that gets students to be able to question faculty members about what the truth looks like and to negotiate it and to say my reading doesn't say that so it puts adam and eve in central africa central east africa you can't imagine it in other locations where some people might want us to think it is you then situate 
the creation of gatherings of human beings into larger bodies like you would call cities 12,000 years ago. But in Africa, you will have languages that are written back six to 7,000 years. But in Africa, you will have philosophies that undergird the big three, meaning Judaism, Islam, and Christianity that are based in Africa. That gets you to think about the world differently. People are joking about the black Jesus because if you look at what's called the Middle East, it is North West, excuse me, Northeast Africa. You can walk from Cairo to Jerusalem. Take you a day or two, but you can walk to them. So those sorts of things are threatening. So we expected it. So what happened was we had this great report. So every single time somebody says, but you didn't study it, we can point at it. But now the bill is the teeth because we demonstrated that the university, the same presidents, the same chancellor, the same people who signed on to this report and said it was a good idea are now saying tap the brakes, slow down. And we're saying, <laughs> Not only has the field been asking for over 50 years, but the universe has been doing it for thousands of years. And some of us literally, Dr. Weber, a little longer than I, 40 years at San, uh, at, at, in the state system. I've been 40 years in higher education, only 30 of them in the state system. We've been doing the right things. So you have to have the conceptualization, which occurred originally in ethnic studies. As I said, there were folks, studied folks who created this and they were revolutionary activists who said, and we know it will not necessarily be accepted, so it's going to need the activism to make it happen. The demand must be put on power for it to conceive. So the two going hand in hand, activism and intellectualism is powerful. And unfortunately, it's frightening to people, again, as I would say, who would have the opportunity to liberate themselves. We can't carry that water for them, but it is our job to liberate ourselves and leave space for others to liberate themselves. You know, and I think, uh, Ken, also, yes. the, the, the California Legislative Black Caucus. You're on mute, I'm mute, I'm, excuse me, I'm sorry. The Chancellor came to meet with us and um, uh, he was new. And that was a request of the Black Caucus that <laughs> Black Studies had been the jewel of the CSU system. And it was being under attack at Northridge and a few other places in Long Beach. And we said, you need to form a committee to do this. And so the Black Caucus put on, on him to form a committee. Mm -hmm. and, when, and they came to us with the results. And so we waited and waited and kind of kept trying to negotiate. And as a result of realizing after six years or so that there was not going to be any negotiation, that's when we decided to author the bill. So the Black Caucus had asked for this report and for the study to be done yeah. concerning the significance of Black studies to the CSU. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I do mention the report because it would help some of the people who are saying, yes. where could I start with some uh, recommendations? Uh, best models, uh, I, for uh, best models, start with getting a real course and a real person qualified to teach it in your elementary schools, and then get a critical mass of folks, of community people, to get more than one course. Uh, but you, you, basically, you can get the whole conceptual thing down. But the first thing is, get a step that's doable, workable, and then makes you permanent. Uh, and so get a class in there with a regular teacher who is going to get to tenure in that elementary school or high school, as we would do at the college level. And, um, and in special ed, um, I'd have to call my niece who's better at that than I. Uh, but given what I know about the learning issues from a, I'm a learning psychologist, but given that what we know is it culturally appropriate materials and materials that are relevant to the pain and challenges of the of the learner themselves enhance learning that part i can get you the data for um look up uh, google me ken montero san francisco state if i get a note from anybody i will respond to you it may take a couple of days but i will do that and i'll send you literature if you'd like that on such things now i actually asked some people in special ed for something specifically for special ed but i've got a fair amount on learning and the impact of uh, black studies and ethnic studies in learning and, and school-like achievement. Great, so we're coming to the end of our time, but I just wanted to lift up some of the things that we've heard. One, 
When you talk about Black studies, it's absolutely about correcting the record. It's absolutely about making sure that we tell the truth. They not only lie when they're telling us what Black studies is and is not, we watched them do it um, throughout the course of trying to move this bill forward, but also throughout the course of our existence as Black studies. So we're absolutely about correcting the record. We're absolutely about giving information that is hidden from us, right? So they tried to act like we were making it up when we say policing evolves from slave catching. They are not going to say that in their regular criminology classes, but if you take a Black Studies class, we will point back and make it irrefutable that the reason that you see these outcomes is because you cannot reform a system, tinker around the edges of a system that is rooted in chattel slavery, right? As ridiculous as it sounds to say reform chattel slavery, that's the same ridiculousness when they say, you know, just give officers a little bit of uh, implicit bias training, right? And then that'll solve it, right? And so it's important that we correct the record. It's important that we tell the truth from our perspective rather than telling it from theirs. What's the African proverb? As long as uh, the um, hunter tells, uh, as long as the, until the lion tells the story, the hunter will always be the hero. That's it. Until the lion tells the story, the hunter will always be the hero. So we are the lions. We're telling our own stories. But the second thing that's coming out is the importance of connecting Black students especially um, with their own learning experiences, right? With recognizing that um, intellectual development doesn't just come from reading books. It also comes from your lived experiences, the stories your grandmother shared with you, what you view in your neighborhood. All of those things are truth and you need to bring them into the learning process and we need to value them as spaces of intellectual development. And then finally, one of the things that Dr. Hernandez is pointing to is that the reason that we do this work, the reason we do this research, this intellectual development, the reason that we're taking time in the classroom is not just so that we can hold on to knowledge for our own selves. This knowledge is meant to be a tool for the liberation of our people. And so the work that we're doing with places like Million Dollar Hoods is hugely important. As we close out just a few minutes over, the last question that was dropped in the comments was a book recommendation. So I'd like to just go around and have each of you just say one book, don't give any details on it, um, one book and maybe one sentence summary, but not a paragraph, just a sentence. So Dr. Weber, can we start, start with you? Kelly, your hand is up, so you go ahead, you start. Okay, okay I'll go ahead and get started. W. Roy's Black Reconstruction. It is the beginning of understanding how we tell our stories. Absolutely. Dr. Weber. I, I, I'm blocking on the author, but Faces at the Bottom of the Well is extremely Very important. Well. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, that's extremely important to understand the battles that you're in and to try to frame it in a way so that you really understand who the enemy is and how to fight. Ashe. Dr. Montero. Uh, I'm going to actually pitch my colleague, uh, Milana Karanga's Black Studies uh, text because of its breadth and depth. Um, I use its portion on Black psychology in, Blacks, in the Black Psychology Course Plus, but um, I think it's depth and breadth. Uh, the other I would say is uh, any of Fanon's uh, texts, if you're trying to see it, how white supremacy was intended to dismantle our minds. So anything from Franz Fanon. Destiny. The Black Campus Movement, just because I feel like that book is really good for just laying out the entire process of how, um, how what happened on these campuses by Black students, um, by Ibram Rogers. I can't remember the author, but it's called The Black Campus Movement. Mm -hmm. Great. And my suggestion, especially for this moment, is Black Power by Kwame Ture and Charles Hamilton. Um, and don't start highlighting or your whole book will be yellow. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Weber, Dr. Hernandez, Dr. Montero, Destiny, 
Um, you so appreciative, so appreciative of you. And we also want to thank Philip and Megan, who you all can't see, but who are running things behind the scenes. Thank you so much for making this happen. Please join us again on Thursday, next Thursday, for This Is Not a Drill. And between now and then, we want you to make sure that you tweet at the governor, at CA Governor, tell him to sign AB 1460. Um, make sure you call his office at 916, wait, 916-445-2841, 916-445-2841. You can also come out, come out this uh, Sunday to the Black Lives Matter General Meeting, Sunday at 7 p.m. at Tree of Life Missionary Baptist Church. We'll have free food for you. Um, please join us. And then again, once again, next Thursday, right here on This Is Not a Drill, will be on Facebook Live. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see all of you. Take care. Yeah.